conflict, they hoped. Uh, military murdered one of its founders and others, including his children and others, down to the age of two. Uh, I happen to have met the murdered leader on a recent visit to Colombia. The meeting was arranged by Father Javier Geraldo, who heads the uh, church-based Justice and Peace Center. He himself has been targeted for assassination, and he was withdrawn from the country under threat by the Jesuit order, although he insisted on returning uh, to his work uh, supporting those who are struggling to defend their fundamental human rights. Uh, well, again, uh, all of this should be too familiar even to mention, but fact is that little is known about it apart from circles of people like Crispas who are devoted to defending universal human rights. Uh, I mention these very few examples uh, to remind ourselves that we're not engaged in seminars on abstract principles or discussing uh, remote cultures that we do not comprehend. We're speaking of ourselves, the moral and intellectual values of the communities in which we live. Uh, and if we do not like what we see, if we look into the mirror honestly, uh, we have ample opportunity to do something about it. Since I'm not an expert either on linguistics or on human rights, and uh, since we've just heard from a peerless expert on both of them, I am going to bet that uh, you'll be happy to learn that I want to make my remarks brief and leave as much time as possible uh, for uh, questions for uh, Professor Chomsky and discussion of these issues. Can you hear me okay? Is this working all right? Okay. What I do want to do, though, is say something about the word and. Uh, uh, at least, and try to link some of the uh, developments in understanding universals in human nature to uh, some of the developments in uh, the move towards uh, bringing about uh, uh, a greater balance in universals in uh, human rights. Now, it seems to me that one striking feature about our species, actually in contrast to, to any other animal that I know of, uh, is how different we are from one another. As you move from one place to another, uh, you see that people speak different languages, that we dance to different kinds of music, that we produce and eat different kinds of food, uh, participate in different kinds of economic and family uh, arrangements, practice different religions, and so forth. The list can go on and on. But I think another equally striking feature of human beings is how seriously so many of us take these differences so much of the time. I think we can see this focus on human differences in many different ways, large and small. To take a small example very close to home, uh, the absolute need of my adolescent children to wear the clothes and speak the language that exactly corresponded to the other uh, people uh, in their social group to go to the complete opposite extreme, uh, the uh, history of wars and ethnic conflicts in which people are literally willing to lay down their lives for a total stranger uh, who happens to share their language or religion um, or a piece of uh, cultural territory so as to fight other perfect strangers who don't. I also think that, that we can see this focus on human differences in some of the callousness and uh, uh, neglect in the discussions of Nicaragua and of torture and, and, and uh, so forth that we just heard about. Of course, Professor Chomsky has uh, been at pains to show how public media and public government will manipulate the discussion of events that take place in, in the world in a way that uh, leads us to focus our, our attention away from the issues that, uh, that he was describing today. 
But I think one of the things that makes it easier for the media and for governments to do this uh, is that there's a side of our nature that does tend to focus on differences and, and can more readily think, for example, of victims of torture who speak some other language and live in some, uh, some other part of the world as somehow not being as immediate a concern to us as uh, uh, a, uh, actions that happened, say, to a neighbor uh, who uh, was superficially more like us. Well, I think that perhaps the greatest contribution of modern linguistics, uh, as led uh, by Chomsky in the second uh, cognitive revolution, is the insight that these human differences are far more apparent than they are real. Beneath the surface variability in human languages are deep commonalities, Common underlying principles have to be there because children have to be able to learn any of the world's languages depending on where uh, they happen to be born. And the, as a matter of fact, they learn these languages very rapidly with no instruction uh, and from rather uh, minimal and fragmentary evidence. Now throughout his work, Chomsky suggested that the same point applies to other of the variable systems of cultures. Uh, things like the music of a culture or its belief systems or its moral rules might be understandable within the same kind of framework. Underneath all the, super, uh, the surface uh, variability, there may be common principles that make it possible for a child to grow up to be a competent uh, member of any human society in all of these other respects. Now, I think that research over the last 30 years very strongly supports Chomsky's suggestion. And because I don't want to take a lot of time, I just want to cite three examples of work that's gone on, uh, both uh, in uh, cross-cultural psychology, looking at variability and underlying principles in beliefs across cultures, and in uh, cognitive development, and also in studies of adult uh, reasoners in our culture. First of all, there's evidence that humans universally tend to structure the world uh, in terms of objects, that is, cohesive bodies that move continuously through space uh, and over time and interact with each other only on contact, uh, contrary, actually, to, to suggestions by Quine, uh, who Chomsky uh, already mentioned. There's evidence that all over the world, people divide up uh, experience into objects and reason about events in terms of objects. Now, this focus on objects is evident already in human infants. Uh, research done just this year by Francesca Simeone in Italy shows that newborn infants, one day old, already are predisposed to take what uh, visual scenes they see around them and organize them into objects. This predisposition continues to exist throughout human development, and it provides a foundation for our intuitive reasoning about the inanimate uh, material world. The second example is that humans have a universal capacity to represent number. Now, our universal number representations are imprecise, uh, but they allow us to compare numbers and even to perform uh, arithmetic on um, uh, uh, approximate numbers. This has been shown, I think, most elegantly in some recent studies by the uh, French cognitive neuroscientist Stanislas Dehaene, uh, who conducted experiments on members of a remote Amazon tribe whose language contained no number, words for exact numbers beyond two or three um, and no explicit counting routine. He was able to show that despite the lack of these resources, these people were sensitive to approximate numbers and could mentally add and compare them and, and manipulate them in ways indistinguishable from, say, uh, educated uh, people also studied uh, in France. Now, these uh, number representations also emerge in human infancy, as work in my lab and many others have shown. They continue to exist in us as adults, and they provide a foundation for the acquisition of verbal counting and symbolic arithmetic. The third example, which uh, Professor Chomsky already alluded to, humans have a universal capacity to represent people as intentional, goal-directed agents whose freely chosen actions are subject to moral evaluation. Now, uh, research by uh, John McHale and Mark Hauser uh, have been looking at the moral intuitions of people across a wide range of different <coughs> cultures. I'm actually not going to go into their findings, though if people are really interested, we could talk about it uh, in the question period. Suffice it to say that people have 
quite rich and intricate and converging intuitions about situations that we've never faced or considered before or learned anything by wrote about uh, in our ordinary lives. And I think this testifies to the kind of uh, capacity for unbounded uh, judgments that uh, Dr. Chomsky was talking about. I do want to mention one study, though, uh, by uh, Emmanuel Dupou and Pierre Jacob in Paris, which suggests that this tendency to evaluate the actions of other people may trace all the way back to infancy. This is new work, uh, so I'll actually tell you about one of their experiments. It was conducted with very young infants, about I think about 10 months old, uh, who were presented with videotaped uh, vignettes in which people came out, two different people came out, and engaged in exactly the same set of motor movements. Uh, both people came out and looked fiercely at the camera and then shook a fist and then struck at something. What differed across the two clips was what the something was that the people struck at. Uh, one of the two people struck at another person, a young girl who fell to the ground. The other person struck at it, this is all simulated, the other person struck at a backpack which uh, fell to the ground. And then the infants were shown, the two people again, smiling nicely and innocently, approaching the baby and making social overtures uh, to see how babies